for Google to join us. Hello, Google Hangouts and uh, YouTube people, and uh, hello everyone here in uh, live and direct. Uh, welcome to another seminar here for the Melbourne EV Group, part of the ATA. Uh, for those that don't know, the ATA put out some lovely magazines. For those uh, in Google Land and YouTube, put out uh, the Renew magazine, which is out now. And for all those who are here live and direct, we are selling these at a very special price, and all the money goes to keep this group um, rolling along to help pay for my limousine to get here uh, every week. No, I'm just joking. Uh, and uh, the ATA also put out the Sanctuary magazine. So Sanctuary and Renew, definitely magazines to get your hands on and uh, a good read, lovely glossy photos. And there's some stuff about e-bikes in there as well in the Renew magazine, which is always a good thing. Okay. Um, some, uh, uh, some things that have been happening um, with the EV group since the last time uh, we met is we had around the garages. We went to Geelong, Geelong, the, uh, the home of the failed car industry, but in the backyards of some is the, uh, is the, is the, the seed of the new is growing within the shell of the old. And we've got uh, um, EV enthusiasts and, uh, and, and quite skilled people who are um, putting the nuts and bolts and, uh, and putting the cables together and plugging things together and, uh, and making the cars uh, of today to, uh, to power us into the future. And um, big thanks to uh, Felix for organising around the garages and also to Peter Greaves who uh, allowed us into his uh, highly organised uh, workshop to, uh, to see a Prius that was getting uh, uh, an ex battery pack uh, added to it, so it had we'd have extended range, and uh, and that was good. It was, uh, it was good to see that. And also, it was a, a lovely little talk shop where um, those people down at G Long got to see us here in the big smoke, and uh, you know, city in the country came and joined together, and we had a lovely little uh, soiree. So um, big thanks to everyone who participated in that, and uh, I think we should do some more of those. So Felix, um, beautiful. Um, wait to hear when the next one's uh, all ready to rock and roll. So um, lovely work, big fella. Um, what else have we got? A little bit of um, EV news uh, from uh, around the world uh, is that um, uh, Panasonic and Tesla are uh, putting some money in to uh, produce uh, an EV battery factory which uh, hopefully will mean that we'll all be able to get our um, electric vehicles a little bit cheaper and uh, hopefully some um, batteries fall off the back of the truck uh, for, uh, for all of us EV enthusiasts here in the group. Um, I, I doubt that, but we'll see. Um, also, uh, as far as Tesla itself, um, uh, Tesla producing great cars, but uh, with all cars there's uh, some issues. Um, and uh, Tesla had some drivetrain issues. Now um, um, they've um, been working on that, and uh, they've stopped their production line in order that they can uh, um, uh, work on these issues and um, have uh, two of their cars being assembled on the same line. So um, you know, out of uh, small um, issues, hopefully um, uh, improvements and better things have, uh, will come along. Um, what else have we got? Also got um, uh, the Nissan Leaf. Apparently the, the batteries of the Nissan Leaf are now um, uh, are being sold for $5,500, which is uh, below cost, apparently. So um, there's, uh, if you've got a spare uh, $5,500, grab one of them. You might need a Nissan Leaf to put it in, but uh, worry about that further on down the track. Um, also, the BMW have got an i9, which is uh, a supercar, supercar that'll be released uh, at this stage. Looks like in 2016. So it's good to see that BMW are following up uh, the i3 with um, uh, with the i9. Um, that's uh, that's six numbers better than the last car. So uh, hopefully that should be a, a nice little um, uh, mover and shaker. Also, Kia have got a uh, car out uh, well, uh, that they're uh, test driving at the moment, and uh, it's seen, been seen around about. Uh, it's called the Soul, 
and uh, um, I don't know too much about it, but uh, it's good to see that Kia are now uh, are getting on and producing an EV, which is uh, which is very good news. And uh, the last little bit that I, I know of is uh, of um, a, a Renault are producing um, an EV truck that has been seen on the uh, streets of Paris. So um, that's being uh, test driven and uh, being um, sorted at the moment. So hopefully that uh, will be another offing that um, hopefully we can we can see at some time uh, or other on the roads of Australia. Oh yes, we've got some other news. Yeah. There's four Renault EV kangaroos being linked to a little van that's sizes can linger before Monday. They've been linked to Spotify most of the trial. Renault bought 10 EV pairs of EV number stickers. I don't know what the other six are, but there's no EVs that just rest people on here. Fantastic. For those in uh, Google and YouTube land, uh, they've just been told that um, the kangaroo, which is a Renault, is it? Yep. Yeah, a Renault Kangoo, four of, uh, of those uh, uh, in an EV, uh, EV ca uh, uh, Kangoos have been um, loaned to the Australia Post. So hopefully um, we'll have uh, some uh, junk mail delivered to your door with uh, less, uh, less emissions than before. So that's fantastic, uh, um, fantastic news. Um, now, was there any uh, past... Uh, um, EV events that uh, anyone knows of that I have yet to cover? Electric motorbikes in Witten this weekend, second round of the series. Electric motorbikes at Witten this weekend. Oh, wicked. That'd be great to be able to hear that of them going past. Friday, That'd be... Saturday, Sunday. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Oh, oh wicked. Yeah, oh, okay. And they're mixed in with the petrol bikes. Right, do we know if that's going to be televised? No. All oh, right, I was just wondering whether I can just uh, uh, justifiably uh, put my feet up uh, on the coffee table, uh, kick back and uh, uh, waste the, uh, the, the weekend uh, watching TV, but maybe not. Okay, um, any other uh, future electric vehicle events that uh, people know of? Oh, yes. The uh, Electric Vehicle Association have a, um, their annual conference and um, meeting on October 25 next week, it will be 5, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 7. Um, but there will be a display of um, EVs at Moreland City Council offices on the Sunday of that weekend and the um, series of presentation happening on the Saturday. So it's public? Yes. Uh, for those in Google and, uh, and YouTube land, um, October 25th, 26th and 22nd, uh, the Australian Electric Vehicle Association, the AEVA, uh, having their, um, uh, their national conference uh, and that will be at uh, Moreland City Council, so uh, 25th, 26th, 27th. Um, two of those three Weekend. So it's, it's that weekend uh, that on Saturday will be the uh, the seminar conference end of it, and Sunday will be a uh, uh, vehicle um, uh, EV convergence. So um, uh, if you're in uh, if you're in Melbourne or uh, close by, then come on down and uh, uh, to Moreland City Council, uh, probably one of the most progressive city councils in. In Melbourne, uh, for their um, commitment to um, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, for getting on board the the silent EV wagon. Um, I think that's all the news I have. If anyone has any other little tidbits that would be interesting? Very true. That's something I almost forgot. Yes, um, uh, Rebecca Lee, uh, past secretary of uh, this highly esteemed group, and also the CEO of Red Bites, uh, um, appeared in uh, the magazine of of the uh, RACV, so the Royal Auto Magazine. There was an article. Uh, on there, so if you see a uh, a very pregnant woman in red, uh, with her head through a bicycle wheel, um, that will be Rebecca. Um, and 
So uh, it's good that, that the news about electric vehicles uh, in all, all their forms, uh, one wheel or more, are um, getting out and about. So um, really feel, uh, like I've been saying to some people today, it feels like the 99th monkey has just got on an e-bike. And, uh, and the 99th monkey has just got into an electric vehicle and it's just about, once we get that 100th monkey uh, on board, uh, then, uh, uh, then EVs will be the new mainstream and will be, uh, when people will be talking about EVs, they'll just talk about cars and when they talk about fossil fuel cars, they'll have to preface them with ICEs or fossil fuel cars. So we're close to that, um, that tipping point, that point where, the, where, where we're, um, Instead of us being uh, on the outside, we'll be the uh, uh, will be the mainstream, and uh, the petrol heads will be the ones who will uh, uh, be on the uh, on the uh, on the outer. So uh, yeah, good things are coming. And speaking of good things coming, um, uh, today um, through the lovely efforts of uh, Paul Patton. Um, who uh, has uh, been great in organising speakers for us all this year, um, as well as his uh, great work um, repairing, repacking, and uh, and all things battery orientated, um, has organised for us today a uh, speaker from Beyond Zero Emissions. So um, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Bygrave, who's the CEO of uh, BZE, Beyond Zero Emissions. Um, and uh, he'll be speaking with us uh, today. So Stephen has worked on renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable transport, uh, emission trading and climate change for over 20 years, although um, he must have started when he was about six years old because he looks like a young fella. It might be the fact that he rode a bike here uh, instead of uh, getting fat and lazy in a car. Um, he's worked on village-scale renewable energy projects in uh, Fiji, Solomon Islands, Kiribati, as well as being a senior exec in uh, uh, ex a senior exec in uh, uh, Australian government uh, um, departments and uh, international climate change policy with the uh, OECD in Paris. He's also worked on the design of uh, Australian mandatory renewable energy target in the 90s, as well as uh, on Australia's clean energy future package. Um, for those who want to know about BZE just a little bit, it's a climate change think tank based here in, uh, in sunny Melbourne. Well, it was sunny today, uh, partially. Uh, its goal is to transform um, Australia from its old fossil fuel ways to the clean tech economy that we all need here in the 21st century. So um, uh, hopefully uh, Stephen will be talking to us to today about um, EVs, uh, high-speed rail research and uh, all things uh, good for us and the planet. So we welcome uh, Stephen to come and, uh, and elucidate us uh, for the next little while. And for all those in Google+, Plus, um, there's an opportunity now um, for you to be able to uh, pitch questions to us uh, through the uh, magic of the interwebs. So. Uh, Please feel free if you're out there uh, to um, to pitch us some questions, and we'll do our best to make sure they're answered. So, a uh, big round of applause for Stephen. Great. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, well, thanks for the welcome, and um, thanks for having me uh, speak tonight. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've had a lot to do with the ATA actually, and Donna Luckman and I catch up regularly. Uh, for lunch or coffee to chat about um, what we're doing and what the ATA is doing. So I think there's a lot of parallels between um, your organisation and ours, so it's great to pull some of that together and connect about at least what we're doing. And I'm very keen to hear from you guys uh, later about what, what you guys are doing, particularly on electric vehicles. So um, as per the intro, BZE been around for about six years now. Our mission our vision is a zero carbon Australia uh, and our mission is to show how that's possible uh, through technical research across every sector of the economy. We started with work uh, about three years ago looking at stationary energy, released stationary energy plan which shows how we can have a electricity grid in Australia powered by 100% renewable energy. We then released a buildings plan in August of last year which shows how we can build and retrofit our existing housing stock and building stock to be zero emissions. 
And out of that work, we've just launched a new initiative called Energy Freedom, which I'll talk a little bit more about. We've also released a report on high-speed rail. We're doing work on electric vehicles. We're about to release a land use report, which shows how we can uh, move below zero um, through revegetation and, and other measures on the land. And we're also looking at Australia as a renewable energy superpower, which is our latest project, which we're hoping to release uh, late this year. So that's quite a technical, but also an economic piece. And look, I'll just touch on some of that work as I go, and feel free to ask me questions as I go along. So at BZD, we don't um, challenge the science. There's enough science out there, uh, enough scientists out there saying that climate change is happening. We just, we just accept that and get on with it. Um, and uh, we don't try and um, debate this. We just accept the science and say, well, this is happening, it's real, it's getting worse. Every IPCC report that comes out just um, confirms that uh, and in fact says that with more certainty this is happening and it's catastrophic. Uh, it's, it's real, it's pretty scary and uh, we better get on and implement some solutions and uh, address this problem in a real way. So as I mentioned, we started um, this work a number of years ago, starting with energy. Energy, as you all know, underpins uh, a lot of the economic activities uh, in Australia and around the world. So if you get the energy system right, then it underpins transport, it underpins buildings, it underpins a whole range of other things in the economy. And as you all know, I'm sure uh, emissions from stationary energy account for over 55% of Australia's emissions, so a really important sector to address first. And if you get an energy sector based on renewable energy, then you could mean you can have high-speed rail, which uh, is powered by 100% renewable energy. You can have electric vehicles, which are powered by 100% renewable energy, rather than uh, just the tailpipe emissions or lack of tailpipe emissions being clean uh, and the upstream emissions still coming from coal. We'd like to see a system where we've got 100% renewable energy, so when you plug your car in, you're actually getting renewable energy that's charging the car. Then, applause already, wow. <laughs> um, then obviously out of that falls the buildings um, plan, which as I mentioned was released in August. Um, transport, focusing on high-speed rail and electric vehicles. The transport um, plan is quite complicated. We want to do more work on uh, urban design and public transport as well, but we started with high-speed rail and that report was released back in April. By the way, for those of you on Google Land or YouTube, uh, we're still uh, planning a number of launches of that high-speed rail project, aiming for a Brisbane launch in September, for those of you who might be up in sunny Queensland. Then we've got land use, pretty controversial sector, land use. You know, it's about what we do on the land, it's about what we grow, it's about what we eat, and that land use report is being finalised, it's being desktop published as we speak, and range from the launch of that report probably in late September. Um, and we're hoping to do that through a series of discussions with farmers, landholders, catchment management authorities, land care groups, uh, and really have that as a good discussion in regional areas as well as in um, capital cities around Australia. Um, we started work on our renewable energy superpower project, as I mentioned. That's a pretty, um, pretty challenging piece of work. It shows how we can uh, export renewable energy, but also rebuild our economy to be running off renewable energy um, and uh, showing that clean tech and renewables and energy efficiency and electric vehicles and high-speed rail present real economic opportunities for Australia uh, to rebuild our, um, our economy. As, as, the, uh, as you were saying or someone was saying in the audience, you know, a, a real opportunity with the decline of the existing uh, auto sector in Australia to reshape that and build electric vehicles and sell those and sell them overseas. So it's a pretty exciting project. One we haven't started yet is the industrial processes piece, which will look at how we can make cement, steel, aluminium, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, plastics, plastics and chemicals uh, without needing fossil fuels. Um, and uh, we're currently building a team of volunteers to, to start work on that project. And do you have any links or anything like that? Is there anybody taking care of that sort of work? 
So that'll be BZE. So BZE undertakes all of this work, but we do work a lot with universities. Uh, we've got a partnership with Melbourne University, a partnership with the University of New South Wales, and we rely on the expertise of those academics as well. That's right. We have interns from the universities. We have volunteers. We often put ad, 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 we often advertise on our website for volunteers to join our research teams. An example is a superpower project. We've got ten volunteers uh, around Australia who Skype in and Google Hangout just like we're doing today. Yeah. Would uh, plastics still be using oil and sleeve stock or uh, removal? <laughs> yeah. Look, we want to move away from uh, you know petrochemicals. Uh, Entirely, and so we'd be looking at how we can replace plastic with other, um, you know, other other ways, you know, other products, rather than relying on the petrochemical industry. So that'll be that'll be a really challenging piece of work. And if you're interested in that, please don't hesitate to come up to me and ask afterwards because I am literally in that space now of of um, building that team. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Like this, this. What we're thinking about is with that with that report is having a series of case studies. You know, so a case study on uh, plastics and chemicals, a case study on aluminium, a case study on uh, steel, uh, and so the list goes on. And recycling as well. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Um, these are our three reports. Um, you can access them online on our website, bze.org.au. Uh, you can download them for free. We've actually just launched this week an online shop, uh, which means if you do want a hard copy, we're selling those through our online shop on the website. So, um, um, yeah, qu quite exciting. And as I said, there's plenty more reports uh, on their way. This is the kind of future. Um, that we're seeking. Uh, this is the vision that we would like Australia to be part of. Um, these slides are obviously from um, cities and towns uh, overseas, but as we've seen in Australia, there's plenty more um, wind farms being built. Hopefully the renewable energy target will stay in its present form, if not um, increase. We believe that the renewable energy target should be a lot bigger than 20%. And uh, you know we've got other countries overseas going for much more ambitious renewable energy targets, and uh, Australia, given its huge potential in wind, pump storage, hydro, um, solar thermal, PV, etc., we can be moving to a 100% renewable energy uh, economy. As you probably know, we've done a lot of work on concentrated solar thermal. This has kind of been our brand, BCD's brand, for a number of years. Um, and you know this this kind of technology um, is very powerful and really busts the myth that uh, renewables don't work when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, as we've heard from the prime minister. Um, we are showing through through our work on renewable energy that these technologies are available to have 24-hour power, and uh, we should be getting on and building them. Plants like this are being built in the USA in Morocco, in Chile, in uh, um, Spain. Spain, you know, every inhabited continent in the world is building this. Um, so hopefully Australia <laughs> will be the next inhabited continent to build this. We've seen some really encouraging moves in Port Augusta recently. Uh, we've been working a lot with uh, the people in Port Augusta and with the previous mayor in Port Augusta who wanted to build this technology in Port Augusta. We've heard recently from Alinta that they, uh, they've been conducting a feasibility study into solar thermal, concentrated solar thermal in Port Augusta, and they've announced just in the last few weeks that they want to go ahead. So that's very encouraging news. Uh, fully supportive of this, Alinta, please go ahead. Secure the finance, uh, secure the partner to build it, and uh, let's get on with it because once we build one, we should be building a lot more. This is the future we don't want, uh, and this is uh, you know uh, this is very real. Um, this is a real photo, and we don't want any more of this stuff. It's Hazelwood. Yeah. This uh, concentrated solar thermal um, has the potential for 24/7 power. Um, recently, we had a plant uh, in Spain produce 36 days straight 
of 24/7 power. So this is this is not some space age technology. This is stored power. Stored power. So, so sort of not, there and that's right. So the the you the, there's a hell of a lot of energy that goes to heat the the, the solar tower that um, that stores the energy in molten salt. The salt uh, keeps the energy going through the night, and then when the sun kicks in the next day, so it goes on. Sorry. What kind of they salvage the um? Um, it's it's basically molten salt technology, and it's basically I've, I've got another model I could show you, oh, but sorry. yeah, 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 yeah. But um, it's a, it's essentially a very um, clever technology by allowing that heat to be stored, and then uh, that heat drawn off through the evening and through you know when the sun's not shining to still create the, you know still generate that energy and allow um, the turbines to keep moving um, 24 hours a day. Yeah, that's right. We've seen huge um, increases uh, in the installation of PV around the world. You can just see the exponential increase that's going on. This is what's led to solar PV prices dropping by over a third in the last couple of years. And um, this is a global phenomenon. This is not just what's happening in Australia. We're all benefiting in Australia. We're all uh, a lot, you know. We've got 1.4 million houses in Australia already uh, with PV on their roofs. Another 3.5 million houses projected to put solar PV on their roofs over the next five years. That makes five million houses, households in Australia with solar PV. This is a revolution. It's really uh, revolutionising the way the energy sector works in Australia. It's addressing things like peak demand um, in in the middle of the day in summer where you've got air conditioners. All coming on. That's exactly the same time that solar PV is is chipping into the grid. It's reducing the spikes in energy demand, and meaning that wholesale energy prices, instead of peaking at forty five hundred dollars a megawatt hour as they were three years ago in the heat wave in South Australia and Melbourne, they're only peaking at five hundred dollars a megawatt hour. So, huge benefits for the grid. Huge benefits for the consumer in terms of um, reduction in uh, in wholesale electricity prices. Do yeah. uh, you know any Australian companies looking at actually making a grid capable of dealing with all this and each other with the power problem? Yeah, it's look, there's overseas companies, but I'm yet to hear an Australian company actually taking this seriously. Yeah, look, there's a lot of Australian companies um, taking this seriously because you need the grid yeah. to distribute this energy. And as I mentioned, these technologies, solar, solar PV, and other technologies, enhance the grid. Yeah. They, they they don't destabilize it. They actually enhance the grid and support the grid and its operation around Australia. Huge potential in South Australia as well with pump storage hydro, wind, solar thermal, where we could potentially connect the grid up to WA as well and have that renewable energy going both ways from WA and from the south of Australia through to WA. Like AGL or Origin or as we know, AGL and Origin uh, maybe uh, could be a bit more progressive in this space. Uh, they're the ones who are challenging the RET, uh, the Renewable Energy Target. We'd like to be working with Origin and AGL because this revolution is occurring. It's happening regardless of uh, what they are doing on on gas. Um, you know, we have a pretty strong no gas message in BZD. Gas is a fossil fuel. Gas prices are rising to meet the international price. That's going to that's going to double uh, gas prices in the very near future, uh, and we're you know we're we're encouraging um, a no gas message because we have the the electrical uh, appliances in both cooking and heating to and high efficiency appliances to meet those energy needs. We've seen the same with wind. So the wind phenomena is again. Uh, really kicking off again, exponential growth uh, globally. The most uh, new installed capacity in Europe in 2010 was from wind, not from coal, not from gas, not from solar. It was from wind. Solar is making a huge contribution in Europe too, but wind, all the, the largest growth in new installation, new installed capacity was wind. And uh, we all know the potential for wind in Australia as well. And as I said, this is happening. Energy companies should be getting on board, being part of this, uh, these changes, uh, and they will all benefit um, rather than uh, potentially being in the same situation as the 
Australian car manufacturers are in right now because they didn't move with the times, they didn't see the writing on the wall, they didn't change their business models to be uh, um, you know, dynamic and move uh, with the times and uh, also um, facilitate some of these changes. Another photo of a landscape that we'd all like to see. Transport, probably a lot of interest uh, from this group in transport. Um, as I said, we've released a high-speed rail report. We're doing work on electric vehicles. And as I said, the transport plan falls nicely out of the energy plan, because the energy plan shows we can have 100% renewable energy in Australia. That means if you've got a grid which is powered by 100% renewable energy, you can have a transport system. There's electric, electrical, you can have electric vehicles, which are 100% renewable energy, trams, Trains, buses, trucks, the list goes on. Yeah. Look on biofuels. Um, on biofuels, we believe that biofuels should be used for those transport purposes for which electricity cannot be used. So we all know that uh, air travel uh, is challenging when it comes to electric aeroplanes. Um, so we're encouraging mode shift from air to rail, high-speed rail, where it makes sense. And we believe, and I'll show you some future slides on the Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane corridor, where high-speed rail makes absolute sense. And I'll present that case for you in another few slides. So biofuels really should be saved for those purposes where you cannot use electricity. And then you've got, because there is there are resource constraints on producing biofuels in Australia too. I just happened to be around when um, the ethanol revolution was occurring, and I was dealing a lot with the ethanol industry and the biofuels industry as it was emerging 10 years ago. The reality is to make biofuels you need the feedstock. And to have the feedstock there are also resource constraints on having enough feedstock to potentially make enough biofuels to power all of the transport systems. That's why we're promoting very strongly electric grid, renewable energy grid, therefore electric vehicles, electric rail and electric buses, trams, trucks, etc and then using biofuels for those, for those purposes can't be used with electricity. Would, would trucks ever be suitable for electric trucks, though? long haul trucks? We believe in the cities to start with, and again, as the, battery, as the battery technology changes and improves, there may be scope for long haul trips. Again, a number of models that could be thought through in terms of battery replacement along the way, etc. Peter, can I just get you to repeat the questions for the online audience? Yeah. So this is the transport work we've been doing. Uh, we've started that work with high-speed rail. We've done a lot of work on how we can re-engineer uh, public transport in Australia and in, particularly in the capital cities, obviously, electric vehicles and, and looking at uh, behavioural shifts when it comes to air travel. Just to go through some of the slides on high-speed rail, um, this work was done by uh, Melbourne University, the uh, German Aerospace Centre, as well as BZD, so it was a great collaboration between those three organisations. And uh, was launched in Sydney and, and Melbourne in April and we're aiming for a Brisbane launch in uh, September. This slide shows you the volume uh, and density of, of uh, the different modes of travel in Australia. Um, the blue being air, the green being bus, the grey being passenger vehicles and the red being rail. You can see here the density and volume of travel that takes place between Melbourne and Sydney in particular, but also Sydney and Brisbane. These are some of the busiest air routes in the world. Sydney, Melbourne is the fifth busiest air route in the world, and we don't have high speed rail. Sydney, Brisbane is the 12th busiest air route in the world and we don't have high-speed rail. These routes compare with the busiest air routes in every other continent. Beijing, Shanghai, as busy. Busier than San Francisco, LA, the busiest air route in the US. Busier than Madrid, Barcelona, the busiest air route in Europe. There is no reason that we should not have high-speed rail in these sectors. Um, 
this is the kind of future we can have. This is a future, by the way, that is, has been the present in Europe for 30 years. Has been the present in Japan since 1965. Um, this it's just uh, astounding that um, we've had other countries have high-speed rail for over 30 years, and in Australia, with the busiest air routes in the world, we don't have high-speed rail. We've done a lot of detailed analysis on the route, uh, and and because of the route that we've selected, which is not dissimilar to the previous government study on high-speed rail in Australia, but our route is slightly different and, and uh, less tunnelling, less bridge work, which means that the capital costs are reduced substantially. We've shown that we can build high-speed rail in Australia for $84 billion. That's $30 billion less than the previous government study. Now, $84 billion, who thinks that's a lot of money? It's, more than also the money. it's a lot of money. <laughs> who knows how much we spend on roads, transport every year? Who might, how, how much? Guess. 30. Come on, Around guess. 18. We spend $18 billion a year on roads. So $84 billion, a lot of money, sure, but so is 18. And 84 is only about five years of expenditure on roads. So let's get our priorities right. Let's get more cars off the road and into rail and all cars going to electric. And then we'll really do something with emissions. The high speed rail that you showed there is like the traditional train on, on steel tracks. I know that there's a lot of a range of different ways to do a, a rail system. Have you sort of looked at any of the alternatives? Or? Yeah, look, uh, just for the audience uh, online, the question is about um, the type of technology that we've looked at with high speed rail. Um, BZE's mission is to look at existing technologies. We don't have time to wait 20 years to address climate change by waiting for new technologies. This technology, as I said, has existed in Japan for 40 years, over 40 years, in Germany for over 30 years. In China, they are going gangbusters with high-speed rail. In fact, the person I spoke to from the German Aerospace Centre was saying that high-speed rail in Europe is not high-speed rail. It's a very fast train. China is very far, is, is high speed rail. Their trains are going 450 kilometers an hour. In Europe, they're you know more like 300, 350. Uh, same with Japan. So China is really pushing this hard. They've got routes going you know through all of the major capital cities where you pretty much live in Shanghai and work in Beijing and vice versa. So. Still the traditional steel rail. Question again for the audience. Uh, online is whether that's still steel, um, steel tracks uh, and, and steel rails and other things. Look, there's a variety of technologies uh, out there, but again, you've got the maglev technology, you've got a whole range of different ones. Um, we've been looking at what you can do to build the route, how much that would cost using existing technologies. The, the technology to actually build the rail and rolling stock is not the biggest cost. It's building. It's 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 having the land availability, building. You know, clearing the the track, digging the tunnels, having the support road along the side, um, having the tunnels and bridges. That's really the biggest cost. The other costs are are, are a much lower order of magnitude. So we looked at the rail path, um, and uh, you know, that, as I said, that aligns quite closely with the um, route selected by the previous government. The previous government uh, and the current government are interested in high-speed rail, which is in very encouraging. We had John Alexander, the member for Bennelong, um, John Howard's former seat, um, excuse me, present the keynote um, presentation at our launch in Melbourne. He, uh, so, so that's very encouraging that, we, that we've got bipartisan support. The, the government and the and the previous government are very keen to secure the corridor because to build high speed rail you need to secure the land, and uh, you know they're working with state and territory governments to be able to do that. So it, it is is very encouraging, and we we uh, we also have a lot of support from the local governments along the route. We've had the Lord Mayor of Shepparton, we've had the Mayor of Goulburn, we've had a number of mayors, including in Hume. Uh, supporting high-speed rail because they know that this opens up 
regional areas for development. We also know that it allows people in Shepparton to, to work in Melbourne. It allows people in Goulburn to be able to work in Sydney. It also depresses and alleviates urban congestion and eases some of the prices that we're seeing in Melbourne and Sydney as we move to cities of 8 million people or more. So high-speed rail has enormous benefits, social, economic, uh, regional, as, as well as most importantly, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, as, as I said, we've done a lot of work on the construction and cost, um, and uh, happy to talk a lot more about, about high-speed rail. Electric vehicles. Um, this work, as with a lot of these at work, is about busting the myths that renewable energy won't work when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, that you can't build high-speed rail cost-effectively, the electric vehicles are clunky and they look bad and they're low-performing and they don't drive very far. So the electric vehicle report will be really showing that electric vehicles are high-performing, they're modern and comfortable, they have a range of benefits including low maintenance costs, low, no fuel costs, um, high performance, acceleration, etc., and they look good. You know, that they are not some kind of uh, car that's um, going to be clunky and not meet our needs. Our research has shown that electric vehicles will meet 93% of all passenger trip, trips undertaken in Australia. 93%. So a lot of people go, oh, I no, won't be able to use my electric vehicle for all of my needs. Maybe not, but you better meet them for 93% of your needs on average. And for those long distance trips or when you go out in the desert or when you go you know, camping out in the middle of nowhere, you might like to hire a car. But in the meantime, you can have an electric vehicle to meet the majority of your needs. Obviously, you guys all know this, so I don't, I don't want to go over this in a lot of detail, but you know, um, Cars are a pretty important part of our lives. Um, they're the ultimate symbol of freedom, ultimate symbol of power in many cases. We use a lot of fuel in this country. We consume 18 billion litres of petrol, all imported, $20 billion uh, a year uh, that we spend in this country on importing uh, fuel to run our cars. That's a pretty big impact on our balance of payments. Not only that, is passenger vehicle emissions account for 7% of all of our emissions in Australia. That's a huge, huge number. If you include trucks and buses and other things, you get up to 12%. So um, if we can move to electric vehicles as quickly as possible, and we all know that is possible right now, then we can immediately save ourselves $20 billion worth of, uh, of uh, Australian dollars being spent on importing petrol and we can have a dramatic impact, dramatic impact on reducing emissions. And this report will also be looking at how electric vehicles can enhance our way of life, uh, lower noise in the city. Who's go, who goes to bed at night and you can hear that hum of, you know, background noise of motor vehicles, you know? Electric vehicles, there'll still be some noise of the tyres on the road and other things, but you can just imagine cities will be a lot quieter. Um, other benefits like being able to charge your car during the day, you go to a shopping centre, you go to work, you plug your car in, you come home, you you guys all know this, I'm speaking to the converted, plug it, plug it in, enhance the grid, use it to run your, your car, support your battery, use it to run your house, support your batteries that might be, uh, or the grid that might be um, being really stressed at that time with everyone coming home and switching everything on uh, to do cooking and watching TV, etc. We're looking at the range of models out there. Uh, again, this report is about not saying we have to wait for these technologies in the future. It's about saying these technologies are here right now. Here's a range of um, different uh, makes and models. Here's what they can do. Here's their range. Here's their speed. Here's their um, uh, storage capacity, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You all know the Tesla Model S is being launched in September or so. Um, and you all know that that vehicle can go from zero to one hundred and four point four seconds. Uh, you know, when people excellent, yep, excellent, and uh, and um, you know, so when people say they're not high performing, you just say, have a drive. White zombie. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I don't need to tell you guys about this stuff. Um, uh, 
We've also done a lot of work on buildings. As I said, we launched our um, buildings plan in August. People think a zero emissions building is something like this. But in fact, it's actually your stock standard three bedroom brick veneer house in the suburbs, uh, which can be retrofitted to be zero emissions. And uh, we've done a bit of work on this, um, showing how um, we can um, reduce residential energy use by 53% through the initiatives outlined in the plan, reduce non-residential energy use by 44%. There's potential in Australia for 33,000 megawatts of rooftop solar. We did that through some GIS work and satellite um, work. And as we all know, um, the costs of these uh, retrofits and initiatives can be offset by the savings uh, that you get on your energy bills. We've, we've looked at all the different things you can do in your home. Um, and again, this report's available online, so you can see a lot of the detail because the fine print's uh, a little bit small on the screen. But essentially through um, a whole range of measures, uh, including LED lights, insulation double glazing, uh, heating vention, ventilation and cooling upgrades, uh, heat pump hot water, um, electric cooking, high efficiency induction cook stoves, and then through energy monitoring, in-home displays, etc. You can essentially go from having an average energy consumption of uh, um, over 200 megajoules per day through LEDs, insulation double glazing, um, heat pump hot water, induction cook stove, etc. You can go down to around 50 megajoules per day. That's a reduction of um, you know three quarters. Uh, so you're getting pretty close to zero emissions. And then you whack on your solar PV system on your roof, average system about 4.5 kilowatts. And lo and behold, you become a net producer of energy, not a net energy consumer. Many of you are probably already doing this in your own homes where you're exporting, if you've got solar on your roofs, exporting energy to the grid and you're probably making money out of that. Um, we've just uh, launched a new initiative called Energy Freedom uh, and this, this is essentially the, the story of energy freedom through going the whole hog by getting off gas, by going with high efficiency electrical products and appliances and then uh, improving your ventilation and, and other systems, uh, you know, your cooking systems, etc. Uh, and then by putting solar on your roof, you can be energy free. You can be autonomous, you can be independent, uh, you can be an energy producer. And uh, quite an exciting uh, initiative, which I'll talk about in another couple of slides as well. So your house can become a solar power station. This is energy freedom. Uh, it's essentially bringing together the three years of research that was undertaken by volunteers and experts uh, in BZE to produce the building's plan. Uh, we're also bringing together a range of in, uh, industry partners to be able to uh, supply um, some of the products. So we've got Energy Matters who do solar PV um, and other things. We've got Cherry LED, a Melbourne-based company who provide LED lighting got Canal for Insulation, uh, who obviously sell insulation through through uh, Bunnings. We've also just brought on two uh, double glazing companies in uh, Melbourne, Sustainable Construction Services and Windows for Life, and they'll be doing the double glazing and providing people with information on that. We've got Earthworker who do the um, bolt-on heat pumps, the Siddons bolt-on heat pump. Um, we've got Intercell who do uh, in-home displays. And we've also got the Australian Glass and Glazing Association. And, um, and so we, we've really got quite an exciting collaboration going on. I heard that, I heard that on the radio, that, uh, like a window template that they kind of give you similar to double glazing when it comes to insulation as well. Do you think about that? Or? It's a window. It's like a window tint or something. something oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The question for those online um, is around uh, a, 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 um, one of the gentlemen in the audience heard something on the radio about uh, window tinting or a film that you can put on your windows which will uh, increase their thermal uh, properties. They, they, they do exist, that's right. Um, however, they're not as thermally uh, 
efficient efficient as going the full on double glazing uh, or triple glazing. Um, the window companies that we're partnering with do the double glazing and triple glazing. They also provide the framing with UPVC or or wood, because you may be aware that. Uh, double glazed windows with aluminium framing uh, as, are not as effective thermally because you get a lot of heat loss through the frames. Um, personally, I've done two retrofits uh, in my own home, and uh, it's also easy to essentially, if you have a wooden framed window with single pane glass, you can literally take off the beading around the window frame, uh, measure up the single glazed pane take those dimensions to an O'Brien's glass or a, another glass manufacturer, they will build you a double glazed unit that you can take back home, put in place, put the beading back and lo and behold you've got a double glazed window for one or two hundred dollars. And I've personally done that uh, and, and it's a great way to retrofit rather than pulling out all the architrave and the, you know the, the, the uh, skirting Pulling a whole unit out and spending two thousand bucks on a whole window, um, so uh, a great way to go. The other thing we're doing with Energy Freedom is uh, we're encouraging as many Australian households as possible to do this. We're asking them to sign up to be part of the Energy Freedom movement to take climate action in their homes. Please tell all your friends, all your family about it. We've already got uh, close to six hundred people who've signed up in just three weeks. Um, we've literally just launched this. Um, we're hoping to make this a national movement so that we can go to government and say, this is a great initiative, this is a fantastic way of making Australian houses more efficient and more comfortable and more high performing. Uh, and please support uh, more policies and more programs to, to, uh, to assist uh, Australians being able to do this because very cost effective way of reducing emissions but also an amazing way of, of improving your home. Uh, you know, we all live in quite leaky, uh, uninsulated, uh, cold buildings. You, you, you come from Europe and you come from the US and you kind of go, you know, what are we living in in Australia? Sorry, you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to say with um, the kind of whole insulation thing from the government, are you sort of worried about that? Do you have any suggestions that you give to the government in terms of how they better execute it in the future? Yeah. yeah. Tax, maybe chucking in windows yeah. Look, uh, the question is, um, you know, what should we, what should we be doing? How can we work be working with government uh, to have really effective insulation programs and really effective double glazing programs? Um, look, insulation, double glazing, and, and some of these other things are some of the more cost effective ways to reduce emissions. The insulation program uh, that was uh, rolled out under the right government was actually a very good program, a very cost effective way, <coughs> excuse me, of reducing emissions. However, you do need the training, you do need the accreditation, you do need the supporting mechanisms to ensure that these programs are rolled out effectively and maybe not in as much of a rush uh, to make sure you don't have those hiccups. Um, my personal view and, and uh, is that insulation is great. Uh, I've personally put in insulation in, in my walls, my floors, my ceilings. I can tell you the more insulation you put in, you can literally feel the cold air going away, any little crack between the bats, you can just feel the cold air coming in. So it just shows you how effective it is in winter at keeping the cold air out and uh, so and in and in summer keeping the, the hot air out. Very, very effective. Um, so Did you retrofit your walls or Yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, the question is how did I retrofit my walls? Yes. And um, I also know how to plaster, so it makes it a bit easier. Um, uh, and you know, also got under the floor because you lose seven percent, fifteen percent of your energy through your floor as well, depending on what kind of floor you've got. Um, so don't just do your ceilings. Imagine a the way we describe it in BZD. Imagine a bucket um, that has holes in it. Um, it will leak, and and you know. So imagine any hole that's not insulated in in your building envelope, and it will leak. It will leak air, and so you need to make that whole space all around contained to to have a really high performing performing home. So very exciting. Um, sets the bar 
high bar for ambitious action, the best your home can be, we're aligning, uh, we're really getting the energy efficiency story sold in a better way. I think energy efficiency has really suffered in this country but also globally where it's not as sexy as renewables, it's about saving something, not building something. So we think energy freedom is actually a really good way of aligning both energy efficiency and the re renewable energy story. And as I said, we're, we're aiming to get thousands of householders lined up, so please um, uh, spread the word, uh, including those people on Google and uh, YouTube. Um, and as I said, it, it's really linking the renewable energy, energy efficiency, but also the no gas message. People say, well, what do I cook? You know, I love cooking with gas. I say, have you tried an induction cook stove? Because there's plenty of professional chefs who are switching to, high, uh, to induction cook stoves. Instantaneous heat, they're safe, high efficiency, you don't have your gas bill. Um, same with heating. Just anyone with um, um, ducted gas, I've had it. I installed it 10 years ago because I was sold on the myth that gas is clean <laughs> and it's a natural gas. Um, and it was low cost, might have been 10 years ago, but I can tell you it's not cheap now, it's not clean, it's not natural, and um, the price is just going to go up. So um, not saying switch off gas immediately, but as your appliances break down, um, you know, move, move, move off gas if you can to, um, to, really, uh, to really make your, your home a high performing one. This is our Energy Freedom website. We have launched it. It's past mid, late May. Apologies, this is a, an old presentation. And um, yeah, that's uh, the end of my presentation. <laughs> Question? On the high speed rail, yeah. can you foresee something happening on that when at the moment you can't even seem to get low speed rail running? <laughs> the question uh, for those online, uh, how can we um, get a high speed rail system happening in Australia when we can't even keep a low speed rail um, system um, moving along? Um, for those of you who don't know, I commute between Canberra, Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane by train. I don't fly. Um, it's it's uh, not as fast as what I'd like, but I do work uh, on the train, I do emails, um, I, uh, I even Skype um, and I travel overnight so I don't lose uh, work during the day and um, you know it's, it's not the best system but for me uh, it's you know having a rail system is better than not having a rail system. Looking forward to the day where we have high speed rail where we, I can travel between those cities a bit more um, quickly. Um, I, as I said before I think this government and the Labor government and certainly the Greens are supportive of high-speed rail. Um, I, I know the current government is, is actively talking to companies who could build high-speed rail. My understanding is the Chinese are very, very interested, so are the Japanese, so are the Germans. Uh, as I said, these, these countries are going gangbusters with high-speed rail. They can, build it. they can build it tomorrow. And uh, really it requires some vision. It requires, instead of thinking about, you know, my next election in two or three years' time, it's actually about thinking, well, what is right for the Australian people and for the Australian economy and for the Australian transport system? And it's simply not feasible to imagine a world in 20 or 30 years' time, or 2050, where we've got cities of 8, billion, 8 million people in Sydney, 8 million people in uh, Melbourne. It's just not sustainable to be thinking about um, doing... Uh, travel by air uh, and without you know people going up and down the Hume Highway and, and you know it's just not feasible to imagine a world like that so we need high-speed rail we need it now we've got the busiest air routes in the world and um, we've got the capacity and the volume and the demand we've got a population up and down the eastern seaboard all of, as you know 80% of our population is along the seaboard eastern seaboard where exactly that linear route can work. In fact, the German guy who came at our launch in Sydney from the German Aerospace Centre was saying, this is absolutely ideal because in Germany and Europe you've got these radial kind of networks, but you can build high-speed rail in Australia in a linear way. So, because that's where the population is distributed and, um, and as I've also said, you can open up regional areas for employment and industry and etc. So, 
we've got to do it. Question. Are there any safety studies done on high school? There are. Uh, yeah, so, so, so question uh, for the, uh, on people online, question about safety issues. Um, the report that we did looked at the safety issues relating to um, high speed rail, much, much safer than car travel, much, much safer than uh, air travel. Um, there are accidents though, not to pretend that there aren't, there are not accidents, so there are accidents with high speed rail, but the fatalities and casualties are much lower um, relatively to, to air travel and to, to car travel. Question over here. So the, uh, <coughs> the rail system, the infrastructure, is it overhead wiring, cabling, or is it induction? It, the, 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 the system we model was overhead, yeah. But again, the costs of that or induction are not uh, in the scale of the overall costs they're very, very minor. Uh, they're a very, very small proportion of that $84 billion. The largest, I think it's over 60% of the costs of that $84 billion are just to get the line built, you know, the tunnelling, the bridge work, the, the, the track, the, you know, the levelling of the track. That, that's the main cost with building high speed rail. And land acquisition, of course. Land acquisition, but uh, yeah, yeah, that, that that's that's not a huge cost though, in 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 relativity to the other costs. Yes, we had a question here. So, um, do you have to take into planning account? You mean saying regional cities and various things, but I mean, does it the overall demographics of the whole thing add to the business case more potentially? Like say, for instance, uh, Bendigo, Shepherd, and if those populations grow more, much more dispersed, is that give you know, sort of emphasis to that sort of thing? Yeah, the question uh, for those online is about the demographics along the route and, and how that may influence uh, the, the, um, the case for high speed rail, I guess. Um, the, the Mayor of Shepparton uh, came to our launch in uh, Melbourne. The Mayor of Goulburn came to our launch uh, in Sydney and they were both highly supportive of high speed rail because, as I mentioned, it allows people in those towns to live in those towns, remain in those towns, and commute to Sydney within, in the case of Goulburn, within 20, 30 minutes. In the case of Shepparton, in the case, you know, in Melbourne, in 40, 45 minutes. So it allows those centres to grow. It also allows uh, new industries to develop in those areas. Um, it means that you, we, we will not have rural urban migration. People moving from rural areas to, to cities. It means that the price pressure that we currently have on house housing in the cities will be eased because it means you can live out of the cities but still work in the cities. Um, population growth mostly is occurring in the larger capitals um, um, but with a high speed rail system it will allow those, those regional areas to uh, develop uh, and develop their own businesses and other things to sustain those populations. So the mayors are extremely excited by this prospect. Um, Pretty much every mayor along the route. There's some 21, excuse me, 21 towns along the route that that um, between Sydney, Melbourne, uh, and Brisbane, and also Canberra. And uh, as I mentioned, pretty much every mayor of, of the towns along those route uh, along the route is supportive of this system. So. Well, actually, what about ticket? I mean, rail travel, from my point of view, is expensive just to get from Canberra to, to Melbourne. Yep. <laughs> yep. So uh, just to let you know, I'm going to spruik New South Wales trains here because I use them every week, twice a week. Uh, I get a um, a pass for six months, first class pass for five hundred fifty dollars for six months, unlimited travel between Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, and Brisbane. Every trip. That calculate I've, I've worked out every trip between that I take pretty much costs me less than fifteen dollars. Um, so it's pretty good. Um, but that's an aside uh, for those of you online. Good, good on you, New South Wales trains. Um, the modelling we've done on fares uh, was extremely comprehensive, and we believe our analysis was a bit of a game changer in this debate. Because the previous government 
modelled uh, their fare structure on the budget airlines. So they they assumed that high speed rail would be uh, would be should be compared to your Tiger Airline kind of uh, price fare, whereas in fact, and and they they basically base their average fare assumption for for um, air travel on that budget base on that um, that budget uh, airline fare, and we all know that that's unrealistic. And so they assumed, oh well, you know, air prices are going to be really quite cheap. Therefore, high speed rail prices will never be so much cheaper than that to encourage people to move to high speed rail. So we really looked at the fare price assumptions very uh, carefully from the previous government's report and we put in a more realistic uh, fare price assumption for air travel uh, over the next 50, 60, 70 years and by the way the previous government assume, assumed that prices would be stable in air travel for the next 50, 60 years which again is an unrealistic assumption. Uh, so we did a much more realistic assumption and showed that uh, the fare structure for high-speed rail was far more competitive compared to air travel, and uh, you know, and, and 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 would therefore also encourage more people to travel by rail, and that has a knock-on effect in terms of uh, revenue generation and therefore the capacity to pay off the capital costs of this within 40 years. It could also the car on the that's right. We had a question on uh, for those of you online about putting a car, um, yeah, on the train. We were looking purely at passenger transport at this point in time. We'll be, we will be doing further analysis into freight and and, and other things. Yep. We had a question that you've had. You've had a go. Yeah. Just to put the eighty-four billion dollars in context, it's a relatively small amount of money compared to what we're just pouring into this. Compulsory superannuation fund every year, and so surely there's something that we should be promoting. There should be some sort of compulsory requirement to separate the agents' fees from funding this large cost. Yeah. The question for those of you online was about um, the 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 scale of the $84 billion required to invest in high speed rail compared to other costs uh, and and superannuation superannuation and uh, encouraging superannuation funds to also be investing in such things as high-speed rail. Very good point. Um, we had the CEO of Pottinger uh, at our Sydney launch. Now Pottinger is a financial um, uh, an analyst uh, firm. The CEO Nigel Lake has been involved in the banking and finance sector around the world for the last 25 years. He presented at our um, high-speed rail launch in Sydney and he said this is the kind of project which the financial markets want to be able to invest in. They're looking for infrastructure projects where you get a good return and the financial risks are very, very small on these kinds of projects. So in, agree entirely with you. Firstly, $84 billion is not a lot of money. It is a lot of money on an absolute scale. It's not a lot of money on a relative scale when you're comparing with A, the cost, with the amount of money we spend on roads. The amount of money that goes into superannuation, the amount of money, the amount of money we spend on healthcare, etc., 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 and B, uh, financial risks are low. Um, the 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 markets are looking for projects like this, infrastructure projects that um, deliver good returns, and it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer, really is. One there, and then we'll come back to you. So, will the overall Zero emissions in 30 years will have, in theory, could have the whole country powered on renewables and there'll be no cost at all for businesses to run, but effectively have free electricity. Yeah. Is that something you try to sell? Because that's, that's really that's where we're going to head. Yeah. Like 40 years, there should be zero, except for the maintenance of it and replacing it with the solar panels that there are. Yeah, so the question was about uh, how quickly we can move to 100% renewable energy, what the benefits of that might be, whether that would cost money for, 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 for businesses over time. Um, look, we believe that 100% renewable energy is possible right now. We can build it right now. We have the technology right now. We can 
houses can generate their own energy and export it to the grid. Uh, and so um, there's the upfront cost, obviously, of the capital to be able to do that. But over time, that's right, energy prices should be coming down, not going up. Um, energy will be clean, green and sustainable. We won't have local pollution. We, don't, we won't have climate change if we deal with this properly. There will be some residual climate change, obviously, from the emissions that have, from past activities and current activities. Um, but we need to be moving away from these old technologies, especially when we have these new technologies. Now, the big risks here, obviously, for the incumbent players, the incumbent industries, the, the incumbent players, which are already in the energy market, in the car market, we've got uh, oil companies, five oil companies control all the oil in, in the world. We've got, you know, probably five companies that own, run all the cars, you know, own all the cars, uh, car manufacturing facilities in the world. By the way, we've got about five companies that own our food supply in the world, yeah. you know, and, and um, it's pretty scary. Uh, and, and that system allows these companies to make billions, trillions of dollars of profit. And they're not going to give up those profits easily. The energy freedom concept and people being able to generate their own energy um, is quite threatening for those companies that, that make a lot of money and lobby very hard to retain that power. and uh, But I would be encouraging those uh, companies to be part of this movement. There is money to be made in this movement. Um, they should be encouraging it and moving with it and uh, still generating business opportunities um, and, uh, you know, um, re-examining re their business models to facilitate these changes because otherwise we're all going down to Google it together. Um, you know, they won't be safe, no one will be safe from, from the um, climate uh, issue which is, which is, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's huge, it's uh, scary and it's happening and uh, we need to get on with fixing it. And it's happening faster and faster. Faster and faster. One question there, one question there and then one question there, then we might wrap. Yeah, that's all right. Yep. Um, Wondering about electric buses, are they being deployed um, anywhere um, in any great numbers and how do they keep them running all day? Look, uh, there's, there's trials. We haven't looked at electric buses a lot. We, we have looked at electric bikes, electric motor, motor bikes, as well as electric cars. But I am aware of um, electric buses um, being trialled in various places. I'm sure there's people in this audience who know more about that than me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, do you want to answer that question? No. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I suggest you follow up with them because buses haven't been a huge part of our study. The major um, BYD China. Yes. Got a lot of electric buses underway, and China has just announced that thirty percent of new government purchases need to be hybrid or electric. 30%? 30%. Yeah. And also that the bus industry needs to step up. Good. Uh, BYD are running trials in America. Volvo have just announced that they're going to step up their electric and hybrid buses. And they're running, I think, 20 electric buses in some small town in Europe starting in about two months' time as a trial. Okay. So for those of you online, the question is about electric buses, where they're being trialled around the world. A uh, gentleman in the audience uh, uh, answered the question about um, China uh, is going pretty heavily on buses. 30% of new buses new buses have to be, buses buses have to be electric. Have to new cars, yep. and there's a push for public yep. transport as well. Yeah, good. And and B and B B B Y D is going for this in uh, the US as well. So yes. that was the question and the answer in brief. Two more questions. That's good. <laughs> um, just in line with your, your talk about business models and changing them, and whatnot, I was just curious as to what beyond zero emissions. Um, what's your business model with them, and how do you see things going in the business world in terms of structuring the business? I guess would be the, the thing I'm most interested. In. Yeah. So the question is about um, business models and about uh, BZE's business model and where we think think things are going in the future. So. Um, Beyond zero emissions, obviously we're not for profit. Um, 
uh, as I mentioned, I travel, uh, you know, with uh, as low emissions as I can. I got here by by bike, my beautiful bike over there in the corner, um, and and so um, like only a mother could love. Like only a, a mother could love. That's right. Um, you know, businesses, uh, progressive businesses, will survive and flourish in 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 the next te decade and more. Uh, we've seen what's happened to car manufacturers in this country where they had their blinkers on, they were going la 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 la, people want V8s and Commodores and uh, you know um, Falcons and Fairmonts and, and no one wants uh, small cars. Uh, lo and behold Australians do want a range of vehicles to meet their different needs and lo and behold uh, we've seen this shift in Australia where now we've got the car manufacturers pretty much going bust not making any money and going offshore. Uh, huge opportunity, mind you, for those progressive companies who'll be going, like Tesla, will be going, great, huge business opportunity, just like they did in the US. Let's buy those um, moth, you know, those mothballed factories. Let's put in uh, electric vehicle uh, manufacturing uh, processes. Let's use the 25,000 people who are already employed in the car sector who know how to do this stuff and re-employ them rather than putting them on the scrap heap, re-employ them, move them into this new industry of the future. And, um, you know, Australia still has an economy, and we're writing about this in the Superpower Project, that relies on coal and gas exports. And Australia thinks that we'll be able to do that for the next 100 years. If you speak to um, people in government and in and industry, <laughs> if you speak to people in China, Japan, and Korea and India, who import out coal and yeah. gas, they're they're saying we're not going to want this stuff in ten years' time because we're transforming our economies to not need coal and gas. So again, it's a bit of blinkers going on. We're going, oh, we'll be able to sell this stuff forevermore and dig it up and ship it out and everyone will buy it. What if they don't? You know, we should be having a diverse economy, one that's not based on agriculture, mining and tourism, because no other successful economy in the world is based on agriculture, tourism and mining. All of them have diverse economies and uh, our economy should be diverse. Diversity is key to everything. It's a key to economic strength. It's a key to biological strength. Every biological community that's diverse flourishes. Monocultures die. Um, and uh, if we have a mono economy, we will not survive. I'm fine with what you're saying about diversity within your business with, uh, you know, with being not vertically structured, I suppose. Um, how do you see that sort of coming into play? With looking at you know having shared responsibility, people at the same level, maybe everybody at the same level of responsibility. Yeah, so we at BZD have a very flat structure. Um, we also rely on diversity of skills. In the past, we've had a very strong technical focus. Uh, we are moving to broaden our skill base to be not just technical, but also economic, social, behavioural, building our communication strengths. Because I think. Uh, it's one thing to speak to an audience like this who is probably pretty au fait with the issues. Uh, uh, I am focusing on getting out to a much broader range of audiences um, uh, and, and talking to the unconverted. The, and the energy freedom story is an opportunity here to talk to all kinds of homeowners across all kinds of places in Australia um, because the energy freedom story one, it's great on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it's about what every homeowner wants. They want a high-performing, comfortable, low-cost, low-energy bills home that's cheap to run and produces energy and it's reduces it's emissions. <laughs> yeah. One more question. One uh, quick one. I can answer yours maybe afterwards. Oh, yeah, yeah my <laughs> oh, look, I'd have to dig up the figure on that one. Yeah. The report's available online. Well, I guess what I'm curious about is the fact is that the, based on the type of travel, why people travel, then business travel, airports, planes, 
uh, communications where they're going, like Skype, etc., is it going to come down to volume in terms of transportation? I mean, one of the main reasons I think that people travel and the transportation plan is because business, as you're saying, travel, will there be a diminished volume due to other methods of doing business, be it um, you know, Skyping, WebEx, all those things. So with all these different plans, these are e-cabs, they're all coming in and melting into one sort of general melting pot that changes the lifestyle we're going to have in 20 years' time. Mm. And this is irrevocably going to happen one way or another. It just depends on what pace it's going to happen. But the driving force of all these things occurring will be the micro and macro business cases that people have, be it on a personal level or a business level, that drive these things. So you're sort of sort of managing it at a, a very macro level with, with, with a government level, but people will still micromanage that within their own cells and their business and their things. So yeah. the options there. So. Yeah, so if I can try and capture that question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Bit of a challenge. Um, I believe the question. I'm going to interpret the question as Maybe ideas how that. do we? Um, the, so the question for those of on uh, those of you online is really about at, at what different levels can we work to achieve change, uh, and and how does the IT uh, and other revolutions that are occurring fit in with the uh, energy. Um, and uh, you know how we live kind of changes because when I think about that, it, it's really interesting. Um, you know, there. Are, I'm sure this is new to some of you in the audience, but you know, um, you can imagine now where you've got glasses and watches that are pretty much you know turning into phones and GPSs. And uh, I, I, I'm a big skier, so I ski a lot. You now got goggles which tell you your speed, your elevation, your 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 miles travelled, and it's all reading out on your on your lenses in your goggles. You know, um, and and as this IT revolution occurs in parallel with the energy revolution and how we live revolution, you can imagine a world where we probably don't own a car. You know, where you think I need a car, I need to get to blah blah blah. You know, from A to B, and you walk out the front door, and a car that's automated kind of comes by, and you hop in, and you get to the your destination. So you can imagine a world where where these things are all happening quite separately, but they're also I mean, you can see Google's heading in this in this way because they can see some of this. They've got the IT stuff, they've got the energy stuff, they've got this now you know driverless car. Uh, I know they're doing a lot of other stuff. You can just imagine if that's already out there in the public, what they're doing in private. Um, so I think there's this amazing confluence of things that are kind of going to mesh, and it's going to happen quickly. You know, when the EV revolution happens, as as you were saying in your intro, it's going to happen like that. It's going to be you know fossil fuel cars. They're all they're all in the scrap heap. Hopefully they're, they're being recycled, um, uh, you know. But but it's gonna happen fast, and you can see the changes in in, in uh, IT uh, which are occurring, and they're 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 fast. And and the opportunity for those systems to and those changes to to mesh, uh, I think is is very exciting. That's probably a yeah, long-winded answer to a long-winded question. Look, thank you very much, everybody, and look, please. Look, please, please, thanks for your applause. Please stay in touch with what we do because I think what you guys are doing and what we're doing, we should be talking more. Um, please stay in touch with what what's going on on our website. Um, very happy to come back uh, and and talk more, especially as our EV project draws to conclusion. Um, we might get, even get a couple of you guys to review it. Um, we, we often get, uh, we're, we're trying to get a few stories in there about you know people who use electric vehicles and all of the benefits that bring, they, that brings to their lives. So looking forward to continuing the discussion. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Stephen. And just uh, one more plug uh, for the uh, Renew magazine that's out at the moment, the off-grid issue. Uh, you can get that online, although it's off-grid issue. That might be confusing for some of those that are not so technically minded. <laughs> off-grid issue online can do. And just uh, one more um, little uh, story in here. Here's uh, a farmer that has uh, converted his uh, tractor to uh, electric. 
uh, made it lighter, and uh, there's the uh, uh, the solar panels that are uh, uh, running his tractor. So um, the revolution is occurring not just here in the cities, but uh, out in the country, in the paddocks as well. And uh, it was really great to hear uh, Stephen talk uh, today and to uh, be able to put um, the, the EV revolution in a greater picture of, uh, of everything that's happening. So uh, goodbye to people there in uh, YouTube land and uh, Google Hangouts, and we'll see you again next month. And for the rest of us, let's go have tea and biscuits. <laughs>